at tonight, Zechariah chapter 7. Second to the last book in the Old Testament, Zechariah chapter 7. And don't forget that uh, Sunday night we'll be having a cookie reception afterwards, so we need buco cookies. All right, so if you could make some cookies and bring them, we certainly would appreciate it. You know what? I don't have my Bible. Why don't I have my Bible? Okay. It's because it's right over here. Zechariah chapter 7. And this chapter was, uh, last, last week was difficult. This one was pretty easy. And uh, you, ne you never know what you're going to get when you open up the Minor Prophets. <laughs> you just don't know. Uh, one chapter might be uh, much more difficult than the next, and uh, that was the that really was the contrast between last week and this week. This one's pretty pretty cut and dried. While you're while you're turning there to Zechariah, I want to give you a really quick story. I thought it was good. Uh, Sunday school Christmas play uh, was in full swing. But when the pastor asked what was it that guided the wise men from the east, right on cue, the preschoolers, each with one large letter in their hands, turned their letters to face the audience. However, the last four kids in the lineup had somehow gotten out of sequence. And the, and, and the answer clearly shown in bold letters was Christmas R-A-T-S. Instead of Christmas star, it was Christmas rats. <laughs> the Christmas rats guided the wise men to the... Uh, <laughs> there, there might have been some there, who knows. <laughs> oh, and I've seen things like that. I've, you know, we've, seen, we've seen it here. My, my one of my favorite parts of a Christmas concert, Christmas play, anything we do like that, is having the kids come up, and because uh, you've always got somebody, always. There's always one, at least one kid. Sometimes there's two, and sometimes they compete. You know, that's when it's really fun, is when they compete. But uh, uh, I, I enjoy Christmas concerts and plays and programs. I think they're great. Zechariah chapter 7. Let's all stand together. We'll read the first three verses. We'll pray and then get right right into things here tonight. Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 1 says, And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Chislu. When they had sent unto the house of God uh, Sherezer and Regemelech and their men to, to pray before the Lord and to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets saying, should I weep in the fifth month uh, separating myself as I have done these so many years. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, we ask your blessings upon this time together as we, as we open up the book of Zechariah, we pray that you would open up Zechariah to our hearts and to our minds Give us the understanding and the wisdom that we can glean from this chapter, from this book. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that we, that we have a copy of the Scriptures. Everyone in here, as far as I know, has got a King James Bible in their hands. And uh, Lord, what a blessing it is to be able to know that we have the, the inspired and preserved Word of God we can open it up anytime. We can, we can be admonished from you in an instant. And uh, Lord, it's just a, a blessing and a privilege to, to have your book. Uh, Lord, the people that we are reading about did not have a complete book. Those that were alive during the time of Zechariah, uh, Israel did not have uh, the Old and the New Testament, and they didn't have because of no printing press yet, 
They didn't have ready access to the scriptures like we have today. So to whom much is given, much shall be required. And Lord, I pray that you help us to be faithful with what we have. We ask God that you guide and direct and bless as we study your book tonight. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This chapter, in this chapter, God is rebuking Israel. And he's rebuking Israel for the, for the rebellion that is in their hearts. Now they, as we're going to see here in just a moment, they went through the, some of the proper motions, but they were, they were sadly lacking when it came to, when it comes to their heart. They were sadly lacking when it came to love and obedience for God. And in the first, in the first three verses, what we find here is uh, Israel's request. Uh, Israel makes a request uh, to the Lord. And from chapters 6 to chapter 7, there's, there's almost two years that have passed uh, since, actually since Joshua, the high priest, was, was crowned and the temple was, was being rebuilt during that time. Um, the, the law of Moses required... Uh, one national fast, one fast for all the nation of Israel per year, and that was on the Day of Atonement. Uh, individuals could fast any time throughout the year if they wanted to. Uh, there could be special fasts that, that could be declared, and there were, and this is what we're looking at tonight. tonight. Uh, but but uh, Israel uh, instituted some fasts in order to commemorate some things, and, and they, they instituted uh, fasts when they were uh, in Babylon in order to commemorate and remember and not forget the, de the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And this was done by those Jews who were exiled to Babylon. Uh, look in, in Zechariah 8, look in verse 19 with me. Just go ahead a chapter, go to verse 19. It says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth month, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth, shall be to the house of Judah, Judah joy and gladness, and, and cheerful feast. Uh, therefore, love the truth and peace. Now, he's looking forward, he's looking ahead, and we'll take a look at that here in just a little bit. But uh, what, what he's speaking of are four fasts. One of them was the Day of Atonement. Those other three were ones that were added and they were, they were used to commemorate and to remember and to mourn over the fact that the temple was destroyed and so, so was Jerusalem. And they were in the process of, of rebuilding both at this point. Uh, the, the question that is asked is, is found down in verse 3. And this is the request that Israel makes. It says, And to speak unto the priests which were in the house of the Lord of hosts and to the prophets, saying, should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself, as I have done these so many years? In other words, should they continue uh, observing the fast and mourn now that the temple was being rebuilt? And they just wanted to know, should we, should we continue uh, with this? Now, this was a, a tradition. Uh, it, Traditions aren't necessarily in and of themselves wrong as long as they're biblical. And this was, this was a fast that, that uh, uh, was connected with the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. Uh, God replied in verses 4 through 7. And in verse 4, he says this. He says, Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying when he fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And he, that's the question. He's saying, listen, was it to me that you fasted or were you just sad and mourning over the fact that you had lost something? Verse six, and when, when you did eat and when you did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity 
and the, the cities thereof round about her when men inhabited the south and the plain. Now, God didn't, didn't give an immediate answer. He basically answered their question with a question. But where, when he finally did answer them, it, again, if you just go with me to chapter 8, and look in verse 9, this is the eventual answer that God gives to them about the, the fast and the morning. He says in verse 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Let your hands be strong, ye that hear in, the, in these days these words by the, the, by the mouth of the prophets, which were in the day that the foundation of the house of the Lord of hosts was laid, that the temple might be built. He's, he, basically, what he's telling them is don't fast, uh, stay strong, and, and uh, uh, continue in the work that God has called, called you to do. Uh, he needed to address what the real heart of the matter was first, and that's the reason why he asked the question. Look, look with me again in verse 5. Verse 5, he says, Speak unto the, the people of the land and to the priests, saying, when he fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even those 70 years, did ye at all fast unto me, even to me? And he wanted to know if during those 70 years of exile, when they incorporated these fasts and these times of mournings, uh, and they practiced the fasting in the morning, did they, did they ever do it unto the Lord? And of course, the, the answer is no, they were just feeling sorry for themselves. Uh, they weren't necessarily doing it with any spiritual, with a real spiritual uh, purpose. And, and the reason why we know this is that they still had not, had not repented, even at this point. They had not totally repented and, and changed their heart, uh, which is the whole reason why they ended up in captivity in the first place. Look with me in verse, uh, verse 6. It says, And when you did eat and when you did drink, did not ye eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? So basically, he answered their question uh, in verse 6 by saying, Look, I know you didn't fast and mourn with me in mind because you never ate and drank or did anything with me in mind. You, you did it strictly for yourselves. So when they, when they ate, when they drank, they, they were doing that just for their own selves and for their own enjoyment. And this is, the, this is the kind of thing that we, can, we need to be very, very careful of. We can get into that same mode. We can get into that same routine where, as an example, you go to church uh, on Sunday. You come to church on, on uh, Wednesday night. You, you do whatever you do throughout the rest of the week. And you basically uh, you know, punch your spiritual time clock. And the rest of the time, you just live for yourself. And that's exactly what Israel was doing. And, and uh, what they were saying by their, by their lifestyle was that there are secular things and there are sacred things. And the truth of the matter is there is no difference between the secular and the sacred. It's all holy ground. It's all sacred. And, and God makes that very, very clear to us. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3 and look down in verse 17. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17. It says, and uh, well, go up to verse 16. Let's get the context. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In other words, everything that we do we ought to be doing it as unto the Lord. In other words, he ought to be in the forefront of our thoughts, in the forefront of our actions. One of the things that I find myself praying often, uh, particularly at meals, is, uh, Lord, uh, help us to keep you in the, in the front of our thoughts, 
in the front of our activities, in the, in the front of our conversations throughout the evening. Um, that was sadly missing with them. Uh, they went, you know, religion to them was a ritual. And when the ritual was over, they just went back to their lives and they went back to their lives living just really for themselves. And our hearts and our minds and our living should be uh, constantly centered on God in, in a, in a continue, on a continual basis. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. First Corinthians 10 31. First Corinthians 10 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Uh, the glory of God ought to be the goal of all that we do. And uh, we ought to have him in our hearts and in our minds with, with every activity that we get involved in. That was not the case with Israel. And, and again, that's one of the reasons why when God confronted them over and over and over again about their sin, they did nothing about it. Now, look with me down in verse 7. Verse 7 says, Should ye not hear, back to Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 7 and verse 7, Should ye not hear the words which the Lord hath, hath cried by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and in prosperity? And the cities thereof round about her, when, when men inhabited the south and the plain. They should have listened to God when, when Jerusalem was fully inhabited and fully prospering. But instead, they were, again, they were living for themselves. Prosperity has a way of sometimes tugging at our hearts and pulling us away from the things that are important. Uh, take your Bibles and, and turn to uh, Colossians again. Verse just came to my mind. Colossians. And I believe Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3 verse 1. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek, ye, seek these things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on, uh, on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. Um, he's saying you have to do that on purpose. You have to set your affection. Why? Because they... Things of this earth will try to draw your affection toward, toward them. It's easy. It's just so easy to get, to get caught up with earthly things rather than having our hearts set on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and it, it can happen so many different ways. It can happen through covetousness. It can happen through busyness where you just get so busy that you, you don't do it on purpose necessarily, but you just kind of, you know, the Lord kind of gets crowded out and uh, you get consumed with the tasks at hand rather than consumed with him. Now, if you go back with me to, to verse uh, uh, 7, uh, it, it, again, God's final answer to, to them was, uh, was that... that uh, uh, if you look over in chapter 8 and verse 19, chapter 8 and verse 19, he says, Thus saith the, the Lord of hosts, the fast of the, of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth, those are the four fasts, shall, shall be to the house of Judah joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love the truth and peace." This is talking about the future. This is talking about in the millennial kingdom, this will be fulfilled. And uh, instead of having uh, fasts and mourning, they're going to have times of joy. They're going to have times of peace. They're going to have times of feasting instead. And uh, the, 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 whole, the whole atmosphere is going to change in the millennium. 
But at that same time, and we'll, we'll look at this here in just a moment, but Israel is going to be changed as well. Um, what we have, have seen in all of the minor prophets is God is constantly looking ahead and looking forward to a time when God will finally get a hold of the hearts of, 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 the, of the people of Israel. Right now, that is not the case. And where they found themselves in the book of Zechariah is really where Israel is today. Uh, God is not in the forefront of their minds. And they are, they are still going through the rituals. They're still going through the formalities. But their hearts are not with God. And if, if God had had, had, had their hearts... Uh, so many of them would have, would have trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. They would have recognized him when he came, uh, but, that, but that was not the case because their hearts were far from him. And then God gives a, a very sound rebuke in verses 8 through 14. Go back to Zechariah chapter 3. Look with me in verse 8. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Execute true judgment, and show mercy and compassions uh, every man to his brother. And oppress not the widow, nor the fatherless, the stranger, nor the poor. And let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone uh, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Therefore it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear, so they cried and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. In verses 9 and 10, God wanted more than, than crying and fasting. Uh, he, he, you know, he wanted more than, than that going on as a ritual several times a year. Uh, he wanted them to listen. To him. And he sent prophets over and over and over again. And of course, we've gone through minor prophet after minor prophet. And then, of course, you've got Isaiah, you've got Ezekiel, you've got Jeremiah. Uh, and, and they basically ignored the prophets. And the, 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 the prophets were God's instrument and God's channel to get to Israel the message that they needed to change their heart and they needed to change their ways. Well, according to uh, verses 9 and 10, what were, the, what were the things that they were guilty of? Well, he, he lines out three, three distinct problems that they had. First of all, they didn't ex exercise true judgment. And part of the reason why they did not do that is because one of the big problems they had was covetousness. When a people become covetous, their judgment goes out the window. The Bible says the... the Love of money is the root of all evil. When, when, you, when that covetousness gets a hold of you, it changes everything. It changes your thought patterns. And that's one of the reasons why when you see covetousness listed as a sin, it's, it's usually listed with a whole bunch of other vile stuff. And, and you, you know, the very first time I, I noticed that, I thought, wow, well, you know, why does God put that in there? with adultery and with fornication and with, with all the other wicked things that he puts it in with. And the reason why is, is that it is vital. And it will cause a person's heart to just turnally, totally turn and turn against, turn, turn against the Lord. It'll change your judgment. Um, secondly, uh, he talks about not showing mercy and compassion on others in Israel. And what he's focusing there on is their treatment of the brethren. Again, they weren't kind to one another. Uh, if somebody owed them money, they exacted that money. Uh, they exacted tribute, or uh, 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 not tribute, what am I trying to think? Interest. 
Uh, they, they exacted interest from one another. And, uh, and they just did not show compassion. They didn't care for one another. And then the third thing is that they, and this is kind of an extension of that not caring for one another, they oppressed widows, they oppressed fatherless people, uh, they, in other words, children, orphans, they oppressed uh, strangers, and uh, they oppressed the poor, and they imagined evil uh, against others and against one another, and, they, and it says they did that in their heart. The problem was the heart. God did not have their heart, and he wanted, he desperately wanted their heart. And uh, they, they showed no, no outward repentance at all. They went through the motions, and they continued with their traditions and, and with their rituals, but they, but they, they, they totally uh, missed it when it came to God getting their heart. Go with me back up a little bit to the book of Micah. And look at me in, in Micah chapter 6, because this is what God was looking for. Micah chapter 6 and verse 8. Micah 6, 8 says, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Well, you take that verse and you put that with 9 and 10 of chapter 7, and they violated that whole thing. Uh, they, weren't, they weren't doing any of those things that God required and that, that God uh, desired to have of them. They did not have a repentant spirit. And, and by the way, you know, we, were, we just we, uh, sang a song where uh, repentance was in the words, repent of all your sin. Um, and that song has been reversed and rewritten. And in our hymnals, and it's one of the few songs, I, I don't like the way they rewrote that song. And uh, they took the repentance out. And there is a, there is a, a real, there has been a movement throughout the years of people saying that, well, repentance is not important when it comes to salvation. Uh, it, you know, uh, once a person gets saved, you don't have to repent because your sins are already forgiven. Listen, folks, that is absolute total heresy. Repentance is all the way through your Bible. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let me show you. Go to Acts chapter 20. Both of these are the Apostle Paul that said it. Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles. We have, we have church, age, uh, uh, church age doctrine is, was given to the Apostle Paul. There was some things that were given to the Apostle Paul that were, that were hidden for years. And, uh, and, and God revealed it to Paul and, and put it in Scripture. Acts chapter 20. And in Acts 20, look down in verse 21. This is where he's speaking to uh, the church at Ephesus, the elders. And this is the last time that he spoke to them, the last time he saw them. And in verse 21... It says, testifying both, well, go to verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, that was what was missing back uh, Back in the book of Zechariah with the, the nation of Israel, there was no repentance. Uh, and repentance is, is something that's needed today. Go to chapter 26. And again, the Apostle Paul, chapter 26. And look down in verse 20 with me. 26, 20. It says, But showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea, and then to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and do works meet for repentance. In other words, uh, if you really repent, it's going to show up in your life. Uh, you know, the, the Bible talks about uh, uh, the, the fruit of, 
of repentance. Well, the fruit of, the, of repentance is a changed life. It's not just a change of mind because a change of mind will cause a change of life. And if, if, there's, if there's no change of life, then there has been no repentance. And uh, repentance is something that you find in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, God always uh, makes a big deal about repentance. And that's what was missing. They, again, they were going through the motions, but, but they did not have a repentant heart. God did not have their heart. Uh, go back to Zechariah chapter 7 and look in verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 it says, But they refused to hearken and pulled away the shoulder and stopped their ears. That kind of sounds like the same kind of reaction that the, the, the Jewish leaders had to Stephen when Stephen was stoned. When he was preaching, when he's preaching, they stopped their ears. They didn't want to hear it, uh, that they should not hear. Yea, they, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, uh, lest they should hear the law and the words which the Lord of hosts has sent in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. They refused to hear. They hardened their hearts. And honestly, that, that describes the state of Israel today when it comes to their relationship with God. Uh, Israel, Israel's heart is hardened. And uh, this, th that hardness of heart uh, caused God to show great wrath uh, upon them. And that's going to really culminate in the, in the time of the tribulation, that seven-year seven period after the Christians are taken out of this world. There's going to be a seven-year period where the wrath of God's going to come down. And one of the places it's going to really hit, it's going to hit the whole world. But it's, it's also going to hit the, the nation of Israel because time and time and time again, they have, they have said no to God. And then the last two verses of the chapter, verses 13 and 14, says, Therefore it has come to pass that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, the he that's crying in the first part of that, that verse is, is, is the prophet slash God. In other words, God used the prophet to, to cry out to his nation Israel, and they absolutely refused to hear. In verse 14, but I scattered them with a whirlwind among all the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them, that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. In, in other words, in verse 13, it's saying that God cried, they wouldn't hear. So when they cried, God wouldn't hear. And, and honestly, that's, that's, that principle is still true today. Uh, if God talks to you and you refuse to listen to him as a Christian, then when you talk to God, he's not going to listen to you either. Uh, I realize that, you know, I just got done preaching on Sunday night on the fact that, that God is accessible, and he is accessible. But if we refuse to have a repentant heart when he tries to get our attention about our sin, and we turn away the shoulder and we, we stop our ears, and then, then we can't expect God to hear us either. Go with me to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. I remember years ago, I was a brand new Christian. I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was sometime in that first year. And I, I started reading the book of Proverbs, and I read a proverb a day. And uh, that first chapter of the book of Proverbs kind of knocked me off my feet a little bit because I saw God doing something that I didn't think God would do, but he does. And, and God makes it very plain that he does. Look in verse 24. He says, he says to those that have, have refused to listen to him, he says in verse 24, because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. He's saying, listen, I'm, I'm beckoning to you and you're just, you're ignoring me. Look down in verse 28. And this is the, the, the part that, that got to me. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, 
but they shall not find me. Uh, you go up to verse 26, and it's pretty rough. Verse 26, he says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Uh, he's, he's talking about folks that he's called upon, called to and called to and called to and called to, and they refused him over and over and over again. And he says, there's going to come a time when your calamity is going to hit, and I'm not going to have any mercy for you. I'm not going to feel sorry for you. Uh, but that's not the end for Israel. The end for Israel in the, in the millennium, actually just before that, that whole thing starts, God's going to finally get the attention of Israel. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 11, and we'll, we'll end with this. And if you've got any questions or comments or observations, we'll let you give them. But look with me in Ezekiel 11. Ezekiel 11. And verses uh, 17 through 20. Ezekiel 11. Verse 17. It says, Therefore, say, Thus saith the Lord God, I will even gather you from this, he's speaking to Israel, from the people, and assemble you out of the countries where ye have been scattered and Jews are scattered all over the world today. Uh, and I will give you the land of Israel, and they shall come thither, and they shall take away all the detestable things thereof and all the abominations thereof from thence. And there's going to be plenty of them. There's already plenty of them, and they're going to be even more so uh, at the end of the tribulation period. Verse 19, and I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart out of their flesh and will give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep mine ordinances and do them, and they shall be my people and I will be their God. And that's the, that's the eventual uh, future of Israel. Obviously, they are not there yet. And you, you, since since that was written and since Zechariah was written, we haven't seen that yet. But one day, that's going to be the case, and he's going to, he's going to have his nation back. All right, any thoughts, any comments, observations? Going once, going twice. Yeah, great. This is after after Babylon. And they're talking probably as a whole different generation. So at least this generation that's come back to Israel, they don't know. I mean, the, the children that were raised in Babylon, yep. they don't know all the things of, of the old ways of the Jews. You know what I mean? The, the, the temple, and they don't know any of that because they, didn't, they were brought up in Babylon. You know, and God's talking to him here saying, don't be like your dad. Don't yeah. be like your fathers. I mean, in verse 1, 2, and 3 or whatever, at the very beginning of the book, um, verse 2, the Lord hath been sore displeased with your fathers. And he's talking to the next generation. Sure. Saying, don't be like your, like your parents. And, that, and yet they came back Full of the world, full of pride and stubbornness, and, and I'm sure they learned that because of where they were being in, in Babylon. Well, and here's here's the other thing too, Grant. They they also they picked up something because they were doing the the fast and the mourning four times a year. So they picked up some of the ritual, but they didn't pick up any of the heart. You know, and and God continue. You know, you look you look at Israel. And, and you, talk about, you talk about mercy. You talk about a gracious, merciful God. You talk about a, a long-suffering, patient God. He worked with generation after generation after generation that really treated him like dirt. And, and you know, he, he did all... One of, the, one of the, to me, one of the most amazing 
stories is the, the account of Israel in the wilderness, that first generation. He takes them out of bondage. He takes them out of slavery. You know, these, these people, you know some of them had scars on their back from whips that had gone across their back because, because of the, the meanness of the Egyptians. And uh, uh, they, you know, they were, they were mistreated. They were worked to death. God brings them out. They see that. They see the Red Sea part. They see uh, Pharaoh's army uh, get swallowed up in the water. I mean, just one generation after another after another, and yet they don't get it. You know, they, they continually drift. I was just reading either today or yesterday about Balaam and Balak and, uh, and how the, 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 whole, the whole nation uh, ended up getting getting cursed because they, they, they fe fell into idol worship. And they, uh, you know, they, they, uh, went with the, they went with the Gentile heathens and followed, followed their, their ways rather than God's ways. I mean, you see that over and over and over again. And uh, they just didn't get it. Praise the Lord, someday they're going to get it. They're going to get it. Uh, and, and when you read things like that, like what we just read in Ezekiel, again, uh, how in the world can somebody say that God is done with Israel? That's not yet been fulfilled. And I don't find anywhere in Scripture where he negated those things. Anyone else? Thoughts, comments, observations, questions? All right. That was a pretty simple chapter. Uh, not, not, uh, not, not as many question marks in that chapter as we had in the one previous. Grab your uh, prayer list, and I have got a bunch of uh, prayer requests to have you add to your list. First of all, make sure you put down on there to pray for the Christmas concert. We're going to break up into, into groups. You can find yourself a prayer partner or two. And uh, we'll turn this place into our prayer closet. But pray for the Christmas concert. Pray for those that have already had invites, those that are considering, those that you've invited. And then... Uh, Pastor Jared Dunbar asked me to, uh, to pray and to ask you folks to pray for his Christmas Eve service. Uh, they're not going to do, they're not going to do anything like what we are and we're going to do. I don't think they've got the, the people to do it. But he knows what's a big deal around that area. And a big deal is a Christmas Eve service. So they're really, they're putting, they're putting a push on the Christmas Eve service. And they've got people coming that used to go to church there that aren't attending there anymore, but they're, they're talking about coming to the Christmas Eve service. He sees that service as being an opportunity not only to reach some folks, but to possibly make some reconciliations and, and just to, to, uh, to, to, to just uh, uh, get some things taken care of. Uh, that uh, you know, uh, patch up some some uh, some hard feelings in the past and so on, and uh, so just pray for that whole Christmas Eve service at Tabernacle, and then and then pray for Desiree Besner. Uh, she tripped and fell last night, and she sprained her ankle on one leg, and on the other leg she fell down and shattered uh, her kneecap. Uh, that is extremely painful. Uh, I will be shocked if she does not have to have some kind of su surgery. She's going into the doctor tomorrow. She was resting today. She was in a lot of pain. And so pray for her. And, um, and I, t I told Nick, I said, look, if there's anything that we can do, uh, you know, we we will we're there for you if you need if you need help with uh, you know watching the kids or whatever. We'll 
we'll step up to the plate for you. So, uh, you know, think, think about it. Maybe there's something in particular that you could do that, in a way that you could be a blessing, um, but it, it, it's, it's tough on her. And she's, she's a sweet, sweet lady. So uh, uh, be in prayer for her. Then pray for Pastor Terrell Bear. Be just like you, just like what you think of the old grizzly. Okay, uh, Terrell Bear used to be the partner of Brother Jerry Sutek, who was over in the Philippines, and uh, he uh, he and Brother Bear went all over America. Uh, and uh, were, uh, were part of what they call the SWAT team for Christ. And they, they did a lot of street preaching everywhere. They also went together, uh, he and his, both, both couples, Brother Bear and his wife and, and uh, uh, Brother Sutek and his wife, went over to Ireland for a short time and were missionaries over there. Brother Bear is pastoring a church in Chesapeake, Virginia, Chesapeake Bay. And uh, he called me yesterday. We had, we had a really good talk on the phone. But he started telling me things that were happening to him. And, and uh, you know, like Yogi Berra once said, I had de- deja vu all over again. Uh, I was reminded of many of the things that happened when I was over in Yorkshire. And that's what he's got going on where he's at. And it's rough right now. It's just really rough. There, there, there is some light at the end of the tunnel, I think. I think a really bright light, but uh, I'm not at liberty to tell you what that might be yet. But uh, uh, just, just pray for him. Pray that he would get uh, guidance and direction from God. Um, his people uh, voted. Uh, he, he said, listen, he says, uh, where we're at right now, he says... Um, uh, you need to either vote that you're going to take me on full time and and take care of us. And he's not asking for great sums of money. Trust me, like five to six hundred dollars a week, and uh, that's difficult when you've got a family. Okay, uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, he uh, he put it out to the. The folks, and basically he said, you need, you need to say uh, either yes, you want me to get a full-time job or, and, and uh, try and pass to this church, or no, you're going you know, to take care of me. And they've got the money to do it right now, and there's other things that they could do to make that happen, even though they have a small group of people. They voted for him to take a full-time job. Well, he said, my health is such, and he explained this before they voted. He said, my health is such, I can't. I can't do that and minister at the same time. He says, it's just not going to be a possibility. So, uh, so basically what, they've, what they voted on is that they don't want him to pastor anymore. And uh, so just, you know, he's, right now he's there. He's sticking it out. Uh, but there are other things in the works. So just, just be in prayer for him, I told him that I would bring it up to you folks, and uh, and I know you pray you you would pray for him. Then continue to pray for the Sutex. That thing is still not in a good place, uh, even though they have uh, basically uh, told him, told uh, uh, Pastor James, Brother James, I, I don't even want to call him a pastor anymore. Uh, Brother James told him that uh, he is in violation. Uh, he needs to leave. Uh, he should not still have church. Uh, he, they're going to give him plenty of time to leave, but they want him to sign something, and he refuses to sign it, and he also refuses to stop having church. So what that's going to do is that's going to force the authorities uh, on the outside to come in and intervene, and that's what I think is going gonna, is gonna to happen here soon. Then uh, we got a, a letter from the Silvas today. And uh, uh, Brother Silva's wife's name is Peggy. Be in prayer for her. She got, she got mugged uh, here just recently. Uh, she was, I, if I remember correctly, she was, I think she, it said she was standing outside of a store. She had just purchased something. Basically, they beat her up. 
and, and left her and took what she had. Uh, she is the sweetest lady in all the world. She just really is. Uh, in fact, she, uh, she and her husband are, are some of the best missionaries I've ever met anywhere. Uh, they're, they're fantastic folks. They've been, you talk about faithful people. These people have stuck with this stuff for year after year. They're some of the, the longest uh, missionaries that we have supported as a church. Grant, won't you agree with that? I, I believe they were, in fact, they, could, they probably were one of the first ones. I think it was them, the Fox, uh, CLA, and possibly one other one, and I can't remember, uh, that were taken on. And uh, as, as first missionaries from this church, if I've got my story straight. But I know it goes way, way back. So, uh, so be in prayer for Mrs. Silva, if you would. All right, and we're not gonna, I'm not going to take any, any prayer requests from the floor tonight. We need to get to, to the Lord in prayer. We've got about 20 minutes to do that. The kids will be done at about half past. So find yourself a prayer partner, get out your prayer list, and let's go to the Lord in prayer.